Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our Open Risk Net webinar. Um, we hope we're thankful that you're able to join us today. Uh, my name is Nafizat Oki from Edelweiss Connects GmbH, and I'll be presenting one of our use um, case studies, which is a demonstration on data curation and creation of uh, pre reason data sets within the Open Risk Net framework. Um, joining me today are Danielle Jenin um, from Maastricht University, Mark Jacobs from Hafra Institute, and Tim Dudgeon from Informatics Matters. Um, a quick, for those of you that might be new to the program, so the Open Risk Net is a three-year EU Horizon 2020 project with the main objective to develop um, an infrastructure, an open infrastructure for providing resources and services that facilitate um, risk assessment in an open way. So including, and we service communities such as the chemi chemicals and cosmetics ingredients industry, therapeutics agents and nanomaterials. So the, th the things that we've been doing so far is we're using case study driven development methods and designing and developing tools that can be integrated and selected on case by case basis. Um, and we're designing solutions for all areas by integrating existing tools from the, from the consortium and building new tools. And um, our hope is that these tools will be available to the public and we're using integrated approaches for combining experimental data within silico and in chemical data, as well as the simulation tools for modeling. Um, we began our webinar series back in um, February with the learning to deploy the Open ResNet virtual research environment. And today we're going to be talking about data curation within the Open ResNet framework. Um, we have some more upcoming webinars in next week. It's going to be the AOP Wiki, identification and linking of data to the AOP Wiki. And then we have some future events planned through April. So um, I'll show this slide again at the end if you want to keep a record of these dates. And we also send out email reminders about these events. So what is data cure? So this webinar is going, to is going to introduce you to what data cure is and how we've been doing data curation within the Open Risk Net framework. And we'll show quick demos of different aspects of it with examples using Jupyter Notebooks and other tools. So there will be a transcriptomic data extraction and metadata annotation workflow, a text mining workflow and for metadata extraction and the data extraction and curation for liver toxicity modeling. And we'll hold the questions till the end for the Q&A and discussion. So data cure establishes um, a process for which data curation and annotation is going to be is being implemented in Open ResNet. So we're making use of APIs, application programming interfaces mostly, to eliminate the need for my little file sharing. As we all know, there this could be problematic. Um, files to get changed along the way, version history is lost, and so on. So one of the key things that we're implementing here is a central source for data download and, re and um, upload that is tracked and, um, that, and also that we can keep a record of that then eliminates the need for manual file sharing, which will allow for more reproducible data curation workflows. And this um, workflow also allows for annotation of the data as we go. So the aim is to deliver curated and annotated data sets, data sets for the open risk and service users and um, preparation of development and development of tools and workflows for users to access, to do some of the things that we're going to show here and that also go other things that are goals of the project and allow you to do this on your own. So as I said before, we have various aspects of this implementation. There are the data sources that we're including that include um, phys and properties, toxicological data, and omics databases. Um, one of our primary sources for provisioning data is the Edelweiss Data Explorer. And then we're also taking data from places such as the liver toxicology knowledge base, PubChem. Um, we have annotation tools such as SciView for, for doing our um, literature searching. And also for databases such as PubMed and ToxPlanet are being brought in. So these are just a few of the databases that we're using. There's so much more, but I can mention them all in one slide. Um, for data extraction, we're primarily using the Edelweiss Data Explorer, 
and all other resources that allows for API calls and um, using API calls and text mining workflows. Our text mining workflows are also implemented in data searching. So we use those workflows as well for extracting metadata and curation of, the, of those data sets. And we provide some of these workflows in Jupyter or Squonk notebooks, which we will show you some of those exercises today that cover things such as extraction of specific data sets, merging of data sets, cleaning, annotation, and so on for further downstream analysis. And then these data sets would even, and upon curation and cleaning, these data sets can be resubmitted to the Edelweiss Data Explorer and made available by API to any other user that needs it. So our first, so as this is a curation um, case study, we picked a specific case here. And um, I don't know if Daniel, if he's ready to present, how do I? Yes. Okay. So as, as a researcher scientist, I, I've been interested in, in, in finding toxicological information on, on chemicals. So is, is a chemical that I'm interested in carcinogenic? Maybe it's hepatotoxic or some other uh, toxicity that is interesting but I'm also curious on, on easy ways to retrieve such uh, data when you go to the internet either for literature research or looking at, at several of the, the the portals that are available which which I sh show here uh, a, a few of the, the logos uh, underneath most of these multiple databases are available which can give you information on uh, several uh, other, uh, yeah, toxic information of, of chemicals. But you have to click and click and then read and then see is this the right thing that you want and you have to click a bit further and read more to hopefully find the right answer. Um, I've done this in the in the past and, and ended up with a huge table. Um, can you go to the next one? Yeah, so this is a huge table that, that uh, colleagues and I, uh, I self uh, made, which contains over 300 chemicals uh, resulting from more than 200 references, uh, including literature and databases. And if you click one more further, then I can explain a little bit what you see in here. So what you see here is, is on the left side, the chemical identifiers are multiple ones. So it's each database uses its unique identifiers. Some will be overlapping, some won't. Um, then you have the in vitro gene toxicity in which I was interested. Same uh, columns with in vivo gene toxicity, carcinogenicity, mode of action, and then at the end, other information. And the, in, in the small bar, you see three columns which actually have the, the, the answer that I was looking for, which is basically the summary of all the columns that you see in here. And that's basically the, the, the use case. So how can we retrieve this information uh, in an easy, uh, fast way? Thank you, Daniel. So as you can see here, this is a lot of information to solve a problem, right? So we need to find ways of extracting this data in an automated fashion that is also accurate and reproducible. So which is, you know, that's the goal of this case study, which is why we picked a real life problem to start with, just, you know, in solving this, in trying to um, investigate the different ways in which we can go about solving and implementing solutions for this um, specific problem. So the first, so one of the things that I would be talking about today, which is, it will be the data curation workflow that can help Daniel with his problem. <laughs> so he, he had given me prior um, a set of microarray data that he was interested in and a metadata file that he had compiled that matched that microarray data. So using the CSV to API app, which is one of the things that will be provided as a commercial service to open ResNet, we uploaded this to the data explorer. There will be other data sets that will be exploded, that will be uploaded to the explorer in the future. And so, like we were saying, so and that's where this data currently sits. As we we're saying, the data is messy, it's always nearly needs to be cleaned and manipulated before you can use it. And I'm going to we're going to illustrate two common methods by which we do this in Open ResNet. I will be talking about the uh, don't know if you all can see my pointer. But I'll be talking about this second half 
getting different sets of raw data, merging and joining the relevant data to give you a combined data set that is useful for further analysis. Um, Tim later on would actually speak more about the first part here. Um, and also, also the second part as well, but this specific part I'm going to talk about will be this merging of data and then the cleaning comes later on. So as I was saying earlier, this is the data explorer that we are using to store all our data, or most of our data. And we can also get data from other, other sources, but this is one of the primary places with which we, get our, we um, collect data from. And here you can see, this is the microarray data that I, I, was, I mentioned earlier that Daniel had sent. The probes are here, and then there's a metadata that, that goes with it. So here, like I said, is the metadata, and here is the metadata that goes with that metadata, um, with the microarray data, sorry. And you can see for a list of chemicals, some of the chemical ID. So this is data, data that was collected directly from this researcher that he had already done some work in trying to get. And so going back here now, this and these notebooks will be made public for anybody that would like to use them once we're done cleaning them up. And this is the uh, microarray data. Like I said, it's already in here. You can get the whole data set. You can get the schema through API. And you know this is an R notebook. But if you also wanted to import this data in Python, this is how you would do it. And you also, so here I have to install several packages for the purpose of this demo. They've already been installed, as that process can be time consuming. And then we can just get right into the data analysis part. So getting the data from the web service, from the data um, explorer here, you know, you, you get your microarray data, you can get the dimensions of the data to know if you got the full data set. So it's, you know, you can tell it's a 17, 000, almost 18,000 lines with 112 R, um, pro array, array files. You can also get the schema for the data to see what that looks like. Um, and from this, you can actually get different values. So if you wanted to see what the schema of that of the data looks like, you can actually get to see the body of that, and you can extract things such as even your column names for if, or specific probe IDs and more information about that through your schema. So this is just an example of what that looks like for different types of data. Your schema would look different, obviously. Um, this is a very simple data set, so this is what that looks like. And then you can get their company metadata as well. Um, you run that, like I did before, you get number of lines to match to see if it's what was in there. Then you can see the column names. Now, as you're updating, uploading data into the Explorer, you could actually give some columns more meaningful names if you choose to in the annotation phase. So up that upload phase also allows you to annotate your data to force some fields to be only integers, some to be only strings or Boolean variables. So that is very convenient, and that makes the data uniform for all that receive it. And then you can then extract here the data that is relevant for your data set. So extracting relevant, match, so matching the metadata to the microarray data. So now we've only subset the data set for those, for, for those files, for those, um, the metadata only for those array files. So instead of having all the metadata, you have only subtract and subset for the microarray data that you have available. And you can also subset and collect information on the specific compounds, also from the metadata, which is what I have done here. And now this is also where it gets even more interesting. You can collect data from other sources and merge with this data. For instance, TG Gates has a lot of um, liver toxicity and kidney toxicity data. So you can check to see if any of your compounds match between TG gates and your initial data set and collect data from there as well. So here we I just extracted everything from the open TG gates data, which is also part of the data explorer. And we have 200, 170 compounds altogether. And here, one thing about the TG gates data is that they use their own internal ID as we all know, that's part of the reason why we have this curation and pre-reasoning problems because different places use a different ID. But with these workflows, you can match 
data across places using common translate um, chemical translational services um, such as the one at UC Davis or the NIH Cactus service. So I've used in this example, I've used NIH Cactus service to sort of map the Cas numbers to some of these compounds for TG gates, and done the same also for the metadata from Daniel to sort of match what compounds they have in common and get more information and extract for those specific compounds. So after doing that, the other thing I could do with the TG gates data then is to collect pathology information. So this is just so this is me collecting pathology information for some of those compounds that match between the two data sets. And now you have now you have meta uh, microarray data, you have pathology data if you want it, and you can also even get more microarray data from TG gates if you wanted it just based on this merging in this simple workflow. Um, being someone that has done this quite a few times before, um, and the fact that we didn't have APIs for some of a lot of these data sets, having them now, actually, you can actually see how convenient it is to just do things that would have taken hours to parse and clean. Now you can do them in little to no, in very in a short, much shorter amount of time, and you are sure about the reproducibility of your analysis because there's more there's limited human intervention in how the data is cleaned and access and um, manipulated. So I think I would now move on to the next part of the, and give the screen to Mark, who will show us the next step of this curation workflow. So Mark, if you want to go ahead now. Uh, yeah, are you presenting a slide now? Yes. So there's just, I'm just going to introduce you and then you just <laughs> go on to your workflow. Fine. <laughs> so this is Mark Jacobs here. He's from Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. And he's developed this um, text mining workflow that I, that we are that we've used in OpenRISC, and I'm going to let him tell you more about the workflow. So just okay, thanks. Yeah. So as Daniel has told us, um, it's not only about APIs; it's also about reading lots of documents and browsing the web and finding text snippets which can give you some evidences on information. And that's where actually text mining comes into play. So the question we try to answer as a proof of concept, there can be many more different questions answered by text mining is, given a compound, and in this case, we will focus on acetaminophen, also known as paracetamol, and ask um, the text mining workflow, do we find information on the IR classification? So can we say, um, is this compound carcinogenic to humans, or is it actually um, not uh, dangerous at all? And this is actually the use case we tried to assemble, and we have set up in the Open RiskNet environment. Could you please switch to the next slide, Oki? Okay. Um, a, a set of APIs, which will go, go through several of the steps of, tech, of a text mining workflow and tries to identify some of the information and rearrange it and make it accessible via an API. So the, the first task in text mining is already, always given some term as acetaminophen, uh, identify the concept which is lying behind it, meaning uh, what's the definition of that um, term, the, somebody's searching, what are the identifiers, the synonyms, what is known about this concept actually. And there are several of these ontology services out there which we can tap into and find information on them. And we use one of our own, but um, we can use any of them to identify the information like Oki has done using the Cactus tool. So there are many there. The next step, um, if we have the information on identifier synonyms, we can use them to find relevant documents in, in the web, actually, and looking into what documents contain information about this concept. Um, in our case, we are using some pre-index collection, which is called Skyview, where the whole PubMed is loaded into, so all 30 million documents, and about 4 million full text documents from PubMed Central actually are loaded in, and pre-index, which makes this service um, faster, actually, than really doing some web crawling, as you can do in text mining. And out of them, you will see uh, in, in our workflow, um, many interesting documents are retrieved by the service, and the next step then would be reading all of them, finding interesting sections, and add to the nice uh, table of Daniel. Um, in order not to just read thousands of documents, we now come to the real text mining, which now looks into more detail in these documents. It will structure them by analyzing them, searching for the method section, actually, um, 
where in the method section is uh, some evidence statements finding about this concept we are talking about, um, what kind of relationships are in there, what can be extracted, and we are then using this to compile the information in, in a short table, um, which is the resulting table out of uh, hundreds of documents you could look into. And the technology we are using is a semantic index as a set of whole PubMed and PMC, so this pre-indexed. And we have some solar OLS index to search for these compounds and um, using then some text mining UEMA pipeline, which is some standard technology, um, open source technology. Um, we are just compiling a workflow there and extracting the relevant sentences about um, the cancer relevance and statements about that one. So if I could get the um, display for my notebook, we have some, done the same as OK has done. Um, we compiled a Python notebook, a Jupyter Python notebook, where we then tapped into different APIs, and I would like to show them now. Okay, so hope this is getting through now. So what I'm showing here is um, the text mining workflow notebook for the data cure um, case. And as I said, um, we have um, assembled the three steps. So the first step is like in open risk nets, all the services are, have to be authenticated. We are using here a key cloak um, where you enter your password and then you get access to the whole system. And next step, uh, we are using um, OLS and Tmall, two APIs um, to um, identify the concept of uh, paracetamol and finding more information on them. Next step, then we are retrieving all the documents using Skyview, as I have announced. And the last step, then using some natural language processing to identify relevant sentences and compile them. And as always, um, we have some, some imports uh, uh, to be done. Um, nothing um, complicated here. Fetch the security token from the um, key clock server, getting then access. And then we can ask for the first already question saying, oh, acetaminophen was the compound we are searching for in this example. Um, so what is known about it? And then we find um, uh, terminology. We are looking here into um, KB. KB gives us some response saying, OK, um, acetaminophen, also known as paracetamol, is known as KB46195. And for this compound, then we have the, the, the definition, actually. We know what the chemical behind is. The service can already answer us that question. Um, we can get some more information on synonyms and identifiers, so it's not that nice uh, information we get from KB. There are only two synonyms, to be honest, but there are other services where we could tap into and use and get more synonyms out of them, um, inchi names, chemical names, UPAC, whatever. Um, but that's enough for our first try to identify um, documents. So next step then is using this kind of synonyms and do some full text search on large document discussions. Um, in our case, we're using our pre-index in-house co collection, but we could easily tap into other APIs um, using Google or whatever to tap into any kind of text documents and search for these compounds in, in this kind of text and, and retrieve them back. So just a question for up for you for, to be discussed, actually, where should we tap into? Mm, um, I've created a few small helper functions to easily enter some identifier of document and searching some document collections and retrieve them as JSON objects or uh, for later on the next step if I retrieve the documents then text mine them and on some text mining workflows and some query helpers so this is very short functions nothing complicated in here so first thing would be using a, a simple full text query saying okay um, using the synonyms I already have identified from the concept service and then searching for any kind of if this causes cancer in human. This is a very simple regular expression to be used uh, just as an example. And uh, then we could use the whole MEDLINE from 2019 to, to search in them and just retrieve the 10 top um, relevant documents. Um, we have different sorting operators by date, uh, by author, by whatever, and come back with that list could also compile that list into some search of um, Pandas data frame to work more on them. And the question is, um, what does this give us more information? So if you're looking into recall, going back, we will see that using this question, uh, we're coming up with more than 2 million documents that there potentially is some information in. And you see that's way too much actually to analyze it in the next steps. So I think there's enough documents out there and we could 
go into more detail and look into the recall. And recall means we're using pre-indexed um, terms and terminologies, not using full text search, but using really pre-indexed fields. And they would say, okay, we are interested in documents which are talking about cancerous um, compounds and especially documents which are talking about acetaminophen as a substance. And this will, as you see, limit the result set already to 150,000 roundabout. So this is a significant reduction already without using a lot of text mining, but only some pre-indexed um, terminology fields. Um, we could do then same um, using full text documents. And again, then we find lots more since uh, um, the PubMed itself is already having abstract information. There's not so much compounds described in. Many of the compounds are described in tables and diagrams in the full text. And if you then go to the two million full text documents, again, a large collection comes out of that, which can be analyzed in the further steps. Scroll through this. Um, so the information, you could pick then some of the documents, you can render them as HTML. And here's an interesting um, compound or uh, information on uh, paracetamol uh, in, in, in context of risk of bladder cancer, which is one of this coming up from the collection I've searched beforehand. And there are some interesting statements in that. And as you see, we have to read a lot of information in order to find the relevant sentences. Um, let's scroll just quickly through it. Uh, uh, but this can be solved actually by using text mining itself and saying, okay, um, large documents, lots of information in there, send them to text mining, do some further analysis and find the relevant sentences in them. Um, then just again, API call, saying, okay, which documents should I send there um, based on the ranking or the relevance, on what corpus are they retrieved and to what kind of pipeline, text mining pipeline should they be sent. So this is the one I call chemical pipeline where they're searching for compounds and cancer risk. And as I said, the, the, the task is to find this classification scheme for the four different groups um, by IARC. And what we are using here is text mining, looking into compound information, genes and protein information, drug classes, um, assay information, and using uh, speculative statements actually to be searched for. And um, after running this text mining pipeline, which can take quite a while if you're using lots of documents, going into the thousands of documents, so it's taken offline and just preloading then um, the post, the already processed documents. and. Now you see that they are way better structured. Um, I can search in the sections of the documents, in the paragraphs, um, then say, okay, I'd like to see the information from the sentences. And that sentence should be a hypothesis being speculative. And it should talk about the KBAE compound 2386, which is acetaminophen. And if we're coming back then with the results, uh, I will see that this whole large document has been reduced to, to six um, small interesting cans. Uh, st statements actually saying, okay, um, some studies are out there where bladder cancer is evident um, for paracetamol. Um, um, it even shows what the metabolite is and that we know more about phenacetine, which is uh, a, a little bit at risk. It's not yet sure if paracetamol is also doing this. So there you see, then you have some information and we could later use this in order to assign some um, IR classification. Um, label to them. And by that, I would conclude this um, showcase and um, just say, okay, uh, given some use case, we could define some predefined um, text mining workflow and then start this and compile the information. Okay, and now I would like to get back to Oki. Right. Thank you, Mark. So, Tim is going to now talk about a data extraction and curation workflow using the data from the liver toxicity knowledge base. And so he did some, some data cleaning and extraction, and then we now show how that data has also been used in modeling, using tools also from the Open ResNet um, inf project infrastructure. So what I'm gonna talk about here is um, doing some data curation on the chemical data set uh, with a view to uh, cleaning it up, making it suitable for generating some predictive models. The data set is the um, L LTKB, um, the liver toxic toxicity knowledge base. 
Um, it primarily is a uh, data set that contains information on uh, drug-induced liver injury uh, for a range of uh, known drugs, and it, uh, the data set comes from the F FDA. Uh, and what I'm going to do is show you how um, you know, show you some approaches to uh, working with that data set. Um, and as we've already seen, um, in, in very broad terms, you can think of data um, curation as being cleaning data, which is this left left hand data uh, data flow, where you want to, you've got some raw data, you want to inspect it. Um, having having found out something about it, you might want to clean it up. You might want to filter it, filter out some things that are not suitable. And obviously, this can be iterative, and ultimately, you end up with some clean data. The uh, second second workflow um, is a sort of a merge join. Um, data um, workflow where you've got two data sets and somehow you need to merge them based on common information between those two data sets and of course these are not independent very often if you if you're doing the merge join you also need to be doing some cleanup as, as, as well on it uh, but conceptually you can think of it as these as, as these two things so what i'm going to show you now is how we do this on the open risk net uh, e-infrastructure so the open risk net is an e-infrastructure project it, um, well, a key aspect of it is the infrastructure. Um, what this means is we provide infrastructure where you can uh, do these things. This is our production and reference site that we're going to be using here. With this infrastructure, you can also deploy to your own um, facilities, either cloud-based or your own physical servers. So you can deploy exactly these things to your to your own environment as well if you want. So on the um, what we call the landing page here, which is basically a list of a lot of the, the, the open risk nurse applications, you'll see a link to Jupyter Notebooks. And when you come to this the first time, you'll get a list of the notebooks that we have available. The one we need to use here is, is, is one that contains Python and RDKit. Uh, RDKit is a chemical, uh, chemical informatics toolkit um, that is very integral to what we're going to see here. Um, now, again, we're, we're using Jupyter Notebooks in this case. Uh, it is very suitable for this sort of thing because it is a very powerful system. Um, you can you can really get your hands dirty and do and do a huge amount of quite complex uh, data processing with, um, with with Jupyter notebooks. The downside, of course, is that you effectively need to be a programmer, um, normally a Python programmer, but you know, Jupyter also supports other languages such as R um, as well. But most most of the time, you're probably talking about using a um, using Python, and that's what we're going to going to be using. Uh, showing here because this is a relatively complex um, scenario and we really do need to get, get get our hands dirty and that really means writing code. Uh, we do have other tools that we deploy into the infrastructure that are more end user focused. We don't have time to talk about those today, um, but we are also trying to cater for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the end user scientist who is not a programmer as well. But for now, we're going to concentrate on, on Jupyter. So the, um, the LTKB data set from the FDA is basically a, a, a set of just over a thousand structures. Um, that contains information about um, liver toxicity. And we don't have time to go into this in detail, but what I'm just gonna, gonna show you, basically we read the data set either from the uh, data explorer that Oki described, or in this case, just to speed things up, we, we, we load the same data from a local file. And you see a number of data, data fields that are present in the data set, and we've got a, you know, 1,036 structures in there. Um, and I said, yeah, as soon as you've got some data, the first thing you nearly always got to do is clean it up. In this case, what we do is uh, we drop a couple of fields um, that, you know, drop a, fields that are not going to be used. We, we do some renaming to convert things into sensible names. And importantly here, we drop some missing data. So some of the some of the information in this data set are, are biotherapeutics, the protein drugs, and they don't come with a smiles, um, a value for the smiles string. Um, so we don't we can't generate a chemical structure, so we're not going to be able to use those for machine learning. So we drop those from the data set, uh, and we end up with 960 um, compounds that, that that remain. And you can see a small example of um, just a few of them here. We've got some identifiers. The key readout here that will probably be of most use to machine learning is this Dilly concern column, which uh, has three different categories. Um, no less 
and um, and and and, and, and <coughs> sorry, no less than most. Um, we can actually analyze this. We do some histograms of those three categories in that column. There's, a, there's some other columns in the data that might, might be useful. Uh, there's a severity class. So we can do some sort of data exploring here quite, quite, quite easily in, in, in uh, the notebook. Um, but now, we, now we're going to move on to actually the cleanup. Now, chemical structures can be represented in a number of different ways some, sometimes you might the salt um, you might have salt form sometimes you might not sometimes the um, molecule might be represented in one way like such as the nitro group um, in the five phalan form or the charge separated form so in order to standardize this we we apply some uh, standardization and canonicalization rules uh, using the RD kit chemical uh, chemical informatics toolkit, and that's what this is essentially doing. So we're, we're converting all the, the structures into a, what you can call a standard representation. Um, that will, you know, that d doesn't matter how they were defined in the source data set, they will be they, they will be converted into some st some some standard representation. And then to skip things over a bit, um, we can look at some of some of these. Um, these are some of the structures in the, in the data set, um, and we can see well a very wide range of range of molecules. Some are very small, some are very big, um, and that gives us a bit of concern because uh, the machine learning uh, algorithms we're going to, we're going to want to apply are probably going to be based around chemical descriptors that are normally based around sort of drug like molecules, and some of these really big or really small molecules may not really apply so well. So let's do, let's explore this data a bit. Uh, two very important parameters in drug discovery are the size of the molecule. In this case, we're represented by the heavy atom count and the lipophilic, lipophilicity. Uh, in, in this case, measured by the predicted log p. And what you'll see is most of the values around here in sort of a traditional drug-like um, space, um, with a log p somewhere around sort of zero, um, a molecular weight, of, you know, sorry, the heavy atom count of sort of 100 atoms or less or so. But you can see some absolutely huge molecules here with five with, with 500 atoms or so, and and very negative, uh, very hydrophilic um, log, log log p values. And we're concerned that these really may not be good for machine learning. So we want might want to go and clean these up. So we make a decision here that we're actually going to subset this data. We're only going to take the stuff in roughly the bottom right quadrant, and we're going to say yeah, if, if your molecules are outside that space, then we're not going to generate a, a machine learning model for those in, in this approach. Uh, we're going to restrict ourselves to things that are you know, more like tra traditional drugs. Of course, we could come back to this at a later stage and, and, and try to analyze these sort of outliers as well. Uh, but for now, we're going to concentrate on the sort of a, a more traditional drug-like uh, approach. Um, so, let's, so, so we look at some of these th these molecules that are the outliers, and you can see they're huge molecules, either fused ring systems or big macrocycles and things. And as I said, we, you know, we're concerned that these really might not be very good for machine learning, particularly as we've got very few, you know, relatively few of them. So what we want to do is we want to go and remove those um, from the from the data set. That gives us 948 that remain, and let's look at them. Um, these now look like what, yeah, what you what you might think as sort of normal drug-like mo molecules. Uh, we've removed most of these uh, of these very big, um, yeah structures from them and this is what the distribution looks like after that so much you know, much better distributed and we think a nice, nicer approach now with these we can now go and generate chemical uh, descriptors in this case just an example we create a couple of um, you know, the RD kit descriptors and the Morgan circular descriptors we're not using them in this in this notebook but it's just that's just there to show um, that we can do that and um, what else do we do? We, we also f found, found we got a problem with very small molecules. As, as we saw earlier, we've got some very big ones, but we've also got some very small ones. And these might be problematical as well. And we want to, have, we want to take a specific look at these. Um, and so we filter those based on the, um, the, the, the number of atoms they've got. So we take all, all molecules that have less than 10 atoms, and we start looking at those. And if you look through, through, through these, some of these are, um, you, you see each row is a, is, is a different molecule. 
uh, it is one molecule. On the left is before standardization, afterwards after standardization. And you can see here in this case of cisplatin, the standardization isn't really working. Um, we end up with ammonia, which, which isn't really very, very, very suitable. Um, was other ones, yeah, f you know, fluorouracil looks fine, no problems with that. With that. Um, but we'll see a number of things, molecules in here that we're, you know, that we're not really comfortable with. Here, yeah, you know, ammonium, chlor ammonium chloride. Why that is in, the, in, in this data set, I don't know, um, but it, but it is. Um, and you see a number of organometallics as well, and some inorganic salts and things. And so we, yeah, we're not really comfortable with having these in our data set. Um, and so what we do is we create a blacklist. Um, we manually curate this just by looking through the data. And these are the ones we want to manually exclude from, from the data set. Uh, and we describe the reason why, which is typically either you know, an organometallic, your trivial or you know, inorganic salt. Uh, there's one, there's a radioisotope, uh, and a few other, a few other reasons. And then finally, we go and remove that blacklist from 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 the data set that we've we've created, and we've got ways of visualizing, viewing the you know, the, the stuff we're left with. And then finally, we can you know, we can look at the data we you know, that remains, and we write it out um, so that we can then use that as input to our um, machine learning algorithm. Uh, and that's and, and that's the end of the story. We ended up with I think it's um, yeah 930 molecules. So we've lost yeah, yeah we, we, we lost around about 100 or so of the structures. But we think we've got now a much cleaner and nicer data set that can be used for machine learning. Very briefly, very briefly, um, it, we'll look at the other data set, um, the other approach, which is merging data. So we take the LTKB data and we've got a TG Gates data set that we want to join with it. Um, so another workbook, uh, another Jupyter notebook to do this, and we're basically just showing in this one two different approaches that we can use. Um, if I can f come down to the to the important bit, um, we you know, where are we? Must be up at the top. So both of these data sets happen to contain a, a, a PubChem compound ID, um, and so what we can do is just join them based on that on, on, on that compound ID. Um, that's what this is. This is doing how we, this, this is what this is doing. We're joining based on the common co pubchem compound IDs, and we end up with um, the the joined data. Now, in the case of not having common a common identifier, um, what do you do? Well, what we can do is we can use the structure itself to basically join the data, and that's what we're trying to show. Um, no, no, where are we? Uh, yeah, this is where we merge based on the compound ID, and we end up with 89 structures. So we've lost a lot of data here. Out of our thousand structures, we only end up with 89 that are common between the LTKB and the um, um, and, and, and the TG Gates data. Um, but what what I, you know, as I said, we 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 also uh, might want to take an approach of merging by chem by chemical structure. So again, we use the RD kit um, toolkit here to standardize the molecules, to write them out as canonical smiles, and then basically join based on the canonical smiles um, that has been generated for both of the data sets. In this case, we get 86 uh, structures that are in common, so three less. Um, that's somewhat expected, but it shows that the, the joining based on chemical structure has worked pretty well. It's worked almost as well as just joining by the popcorn Popchem compound identifiers. So again, sorry that we don't have time to go into this in, in, in more detail. These um, notebooks are all present on our GitHub repository. You can go and look at them. You can go and use them yourself if you want. Here's the location of it. Um, and then finally, um, I'll just finish off by giving you a, a brief teaser of um, what we'll be showing in a future webinar um, on the machine learning um, side of things. So we've got machine learning um, algorithms in a number of partners. This one here shows uh, some work from the University of Uppsala, who are building predictive models from that LTKB data set. Uh, they build a model, they deploy it into a web service, and then you can access that web ser service and run your, run your molecules through that prediction and, and, and generate um, a prediction of the, of the liver, liver toxicity. Um, 
Another partner, the uh, National Technical University of Athens, has a package called Jackpot, um, and here, here we're showing you doing roughly the same thing. This time we're using Python and Scikit-Learn, and basically you can use any um, machine learning algorithms that are present in Scikit-Learn um, to, to, to generate a, a machine learning algorithm. You can then deploy that into Jackpot, where it becomes accessible as a web service. Uh, and you can run your molecules through it. So here's the here's here's the web service um, that uh, you could you, you can then use to run those those uh, those predictions. So um, in a future webinar, we'll be showing you much more about the um, the process of generating predictive models using machine learning. Um, but that's basically it for for now. I'll hand back to Oki. All right, thank you, Tim. So, if you have, this is the time for any questions. If you have any questions, please. We're waiting to answer them. In the meantime, I'll just sort of like to show you how the different case studies in open risk that are, are intertwined. So, like I said in the beginning, we are the um, data cure, data curation case study. But there's also the toxicogenomics based prediction, which is where Daniel's, one of Daniel's second case studies come from. There's the modeling, which is some of what Tim just mentioned with the jackpot, all of which we hope we'll be, ha we'll be having future webinars to, just to explain more and describe more about what they're implementing. The next one coming up in the seminar se webinar series will be the AOP link. But yes, we have the metabolism prediction, reverse dose symmetry and PVPK prediction. So these are all examples of how we're using this open risk infrastructure to work on these different problems in um, toxicity prediction and risk assessment. So we're just going to wait now for the for. If you have any questions, please. Um, this would be a good time. Where Lucian is check. Yes, yeah. Lucian is checking the question. You can only leave them by um, and put them in the question box if you have any. Okay, so I do see some questions here. So this first one is from Sri Bandakavi, and he's asking, are the models generated by a group from Uppsala and, and will they be available on the GitHub sites? So they, they are the, I think they are deployed on the Open RiskNet or they are deployed on our system. I was not involved in exactly these uh, models. This was more of a, Proof of concept, if I understood correctly, or it is as, as of now, maybe. But I think they will be available on Open Risk Net, okay. on Open Risk Net, or 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 our system. I'm not sure where they are, to be honest with you. Okay. Uh, but I, I can find maybe find a link if I get a few seconds. So the other question she asked is if the final data set will be available to all, and the answer to that is yes. All these data sets will be made available through the Data Explorer. And um, well, all our um, attendees will be uh, will be no attendees will be notified when these are up on the GitHub and when, they, and the, co when the code is on the GitHub and when the um, the uh, data sets themselves are all up. Most that we showed today are already on there, except for this specific one that um, sh this um, attendee asked for. So the notebooks are already on the GitHub, as Tim showed you, and the data sets are most are already on the this data explorer. So I'd like to thank everyone that's attended today. I'll especially like to thank my presenters and those from the Europe and the US who've been able to attend and take time out of their morning to be here. If you have any more questions, you can always send us emails um, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Um, Open ResNet is funded through a grant from the um, European Commission Horizon 2020 program. And um, we hope to see you at the next webinar, which is going to be in t on the 26th of March next week at um, 1700 Central European time.